everyone, and welcome to XR Access, uh, our session on inclusive design. Welcome to the session. I'm really delighted to moderate this um, exciting panel of inclusive designers who are designing uh, for and with equity. So we have a really wonderful group of people here today and perspectives. Um, if you could each introduce yourself and say what is it around XR and immersive uh, technology that gets you excited and particularly around inclusive design for XR. If you're happy to visually des uh, describe yourself as well, um, please do. Uh, Johan, would you like to start? Hello, my name is Johan Verstata. I'm an inclusive designer and a sensory experience designer. I'm really excited to be here um, and to talk about XR today, especially as we're looking at the future of the inclusion of the different senses and its relationship to inclusive design. So I'm very happy to be here today. Hi, I'm Molly. I'm an inclusive design researcher at Adobe. And um, visual, quick visual description, I'm a white woman with um, glasses, brown glasses, and sort of long brown hair, and I have books in my background and a picture. And um, what excites me about XR Access and the future of XR technology is that we're building this technology from the ground up, and this is a really exciting time, and it's a really exciting opportunity to involve people with disabilities in the process of that and uh, make the technology more inclusive than others have been and I'm excited to be here, thanks. Uh, hello everyone, I am Regine Gilbert. I'm a user experience designer and industry assistant professor at NYU in the integrated design and media department. Uh, what excites me about XR is that uh, it's not a new technology, but we are making such uh, advances so quickly. And similar to what Molly said, we have an opportunity for folks um, in the accessibility world and folks with disabilities to really get in on this early. So I'm really excited about the opportunities and really happy to be here for this conversation. Hi, Christine. Um, my name is James and I'm uh, very happy to be here. Uh, my, I'm a user experience designer, uh, independent, based in New York. I've been focusing on virtual and augmented reality products and projects for, I don't know, for a few years and uh, definitely um, uh, include definitely included uh, a lot of people from various backgrounds into uh, my projects and and I'm very excited about uh, the potential of uh, virtual and augmented reality it's a uh, there's so much uh, potential to augment our capabilities of everyone from various backgrounds and the innovation that can be found here and it takes a lot of hard work and um but you know it could benefit everyone and um you know just learn from them talk to them um experiment with them bring include them into the design process and the development process and so uh Fabulous. Thank you, James. And thank you all for introducing yourself. I've realised I've uh, been neg neglectful in not introducing myself. I'm Christine Hempill. I'm the Managing Director of Open Inclusion. I'm also the lead for the Inclusive Design for XR Workstream as part of XR Access. I am very excited by inclusive design in XR, both the inclusive design element and the XR part of it, because I think by learning from people with different backgrounds, experiences and uh, perspectives will make this you know, fabulous suite of technologies just so much more engaging and enjoyable, as well as, of course, usable to everyone. Um, and also just not exclude people from that experience that's coming our way. Um, as a visual description, I'm a white uh, middle-aged woman. I have a wooden background behind me today because our house is actually built of wood. And um, yes, really looking forward to getting into this in more detail. And uh, for the next bit, I'd actually like to ask each of you, if you can start by sharing, you know, across the different backgrounds you've got, which are fabulous from research to design to actually building technologies and content, what is it about inclusive design you know, not just of people with disabilities, but definitely including them, but also of any other marginalised group that excites you um, in terms of XR and, and designing and developing it uh, in a more inclusive way. 
Um, who would like to start? As we might do the opposite way, James, can I throw this yeah. one to you first? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I want to be a little uh, sort of open about, uh, I'm very aware of some of the um, gaps in sort of the broad spectrum of humanity that I uh, miss out on. And, I, you know, for varying reasons, I just, uh, I, I, in whatever design project I'm working on, I just, I, I, I fail to include uh, like uh, one glaring problem is I have I, I, for myself is I, I, I miss out on uh, learning more about from people with, who are uh, hearing impaired. Um, uh, getting participants is, is uh, like probably, uh, uh, it, it's possible, totally possible. But it's, for me, it's been like a learning curve. Thank you, James. Um, Johan, to you, your thoughts on, um, in terms of inclusive design, what, what are some of the imperatives for it uh, from your perspective? Yes, well, um, I think we need to start from a human-centered gain perspective, which means that there are a lot of people who are excluded um, and that um, sometimes we don't actually start from that excluded po population. I believe that those experiences are really important. I believe if we start from the people who are kind of up on the edge or extremes of experiences, we get to those uh, innovators, we get to those creative problem solvers, and um, we bring in the perspectives that we didn't think of at all. Um, as I've said before, like with deaf users, when you work with them, you're looking at people who may just have very strong visual acuity, visual um, perception, observational acuity, they may actually be able to help with innovations related to music, innovations related to things that you think are mainly auditory, but they can contribute greatly. So it could actually involving people on the extreme ends of the spectrum at the beginning of the design process is huge, I think, for XR. Um, the early innovators and um, the early adapters, which are the people that are outside of our normal bell curve of average, and the laggards who are on the other extreme um, who might never use XR may actually, you know, be the people who can bring us more innovative solutions if we go to them directly from the start and we start addressing that. So that's the human-centered gain perspective, and I believe that we can really gain a lot from that. Um, yeah, it's not just calling on people with disabilities, but actually looking at it from an intersectional perspective as well, thinking of, as you said before, the, the diversity of human experience. Um, I think it's, there's so much gain that we can think of when we're looking at environments, culture, um, and people's added value. I was just saying with AR and VR in Africa and Asia, we think of those as probably being um, uh, some of the early innovators and then also some of the laggards. And I think if we go to those cultural perspectives and kind of see where those issues may be from the start, we may find some innovations right away. Thank you so much. Regine, can I pass to you? What are your thoughts about the imperatives of inclusive design as it relates to XR? One of the things that I, because I'm new to this, newer-ish, I mean, I've been in this space for the last uh, four years. However, uh, I, I don't know what I don't know. And one of the things that I really wanted to understand is the landscape of what, what this space looks like. And so my, my research that I've been doing is around the tools and understanding those tools, um, and how people work with them. And next I'm going to look into design patterns and there's a lot of gaps. Uh, I think Johan and James touched on this um, quite a bit in, in their responses, that there's a lot of gaps between what exists and what could be. And I hope, you know, that being part of XR Access and having more people involved, and I'm really encouraging more people to learn about this space so that we can fill those gaps, right? So that we're not having this exclusion. And it's not just from a disability perspective either. I think Johan touched on, um, you know, culturally, 
there's other places we need to consider. And I think when we're talking about inclusion, we cannot go without speaking about the socioeconomics of this space and and the barriers that come along with that. So there is a lot to be uh, explored in, in, in inclusion in the XR space, and I'm really looking forward to it. Thank you, Regine. I mean, some apps, I, I love the calling out that you don't know what we don't know. I think this is true of absolutely all of us. And this is an emerging technology space. And there is no stable base from which that we, any of us stand. And that curiosity and recognising that we don't know as much or more than we do know, actually is what keeps us reaching and learning and, and progressing fast. And bringing more people in is equally so important because those different perspectives themselves bring in so much richness to our community. Molly, over to you. The, the imperatives of inclusive design in this space for your, from your perspective. Okay, yeah, the imperatives for inclusive design. I see XR technology as very future oriented. It's this really exciting technology, right? And and with, with my work at Adobe, I've seen how there are so many improvements to be made on these tools that people are using to like build out the future, right? These tools um, have not always been thought of from an inclusive perspective. And that means that um, if the tools aren't inclusive, if they're not inclusive of people with disabilities, and as the folks on this panel have really spoken for, people who are also not thought about in design, people from lower socioeconomic statuses, people who are not in Western countries, right? Um, if, if those creators don't have the ability to build stuff, then technology is just going to keep, keep sort of um, expanding these inequalities that we see. We've seen a lot of examples of that. Right? So I think XR Access, this group, and XR Technology as being a, a technology of the future, right? The imperative is, and I'm building on Regine, I'm building on Johan and, and, and James' comments, right? The, the imperative is to make sure that these tools are, are able to be used by people who might not have had access to like the building of the future. And if we're not, if we're not involving more people and enabling them to build a future, we're gonna have, we're gonna keep building um, inequity in the world. I think there's such important, you know, knowledge in that comment and that constant listening, learning, expanding, which I know is a huge part of your role as a, you know, with a research background, but then bringing that knowledge into a format that people who are not engaged at the front end of gathering that knowledge can reuse and can learn without, you know, everyone replicating, having to um, gather that knowledge in primary format. So whether it's approaches, tools, things that designers and developers can pick up with some inclusion built into it and some of that knowledge that's constantly able to be expanded more efficiently, essentially, across the creation community. That's a perfect segue, and I didn't set this up, but thank you so much for that segue, into our next question, which is really around what are the tools that you're using today or the approaches um, and, and where you're reaching to to bring inclusive design into XR? Are they in XR today um, or, or are you bringing them in from other formats of technology or other areas of design? And what, what have we got today? And then um, after this, I'll ask you about what we need in the future. But to start with, what have we got that's out there that's useful for people to reach to, to help them you know, increase their skills, learning or efficiency in inclusive design now? Um, Regine, can I start with you? Because I know you've done a lot of work in this space. Um, sure. So there's a few, th I mean, there's a few things out there. I think the the first thing that comes to mind for me is the W3C has uh, their, you know, everything is a work in progress and they have uh, some XR uh, user requirements that are pretty good to, as a good starting point, point uh, to understanding what's needed for the XR space. Uh, the XR Association has a really excellent uh, developer guide around XR. And uh, I recently uh, published this on LinkedIn. Uh, it's a list of, 
uh, XR tools and um, their lack of accessibility <laughs> really uh, is showcased. But also um, I discuss whether things are uh, cost money or if they're free, uh, because I think that's uh, important to understand if someone is trying to get into the space, let's say on the developer side, you know, what, what can they use uh, with the equipment they have and everything else? So that's, that's just a starting point. I think just getting to understand the space and because there are so many tools, you have to really figure out what you want to be doing and then kind of work your way backward. Yeah. And thank you. I mean, I think the work that you're you're doing and yeah, we'll be we can get that into XR Access is so important because it's quite hard to find if you're you know on the outside and people different people will find different things. And as you say, different tools will be fit for purpose in different situations for different designers or developers. The other point that I think you know you're making there is are the tools themselves accessible? You know, can we have a creator community with access needs, with various disabilities um, or other needs that are being supported by the tools themselves? And and that is, you know, equally as we're creating new tools to fill these gaps, going to be a really important consideration. Molly, can I ask you next, what tools are you using today? Where are you leveraging your knowledge from? And uh, what, what's valuable out there that you like? Yeah, the, the tools that I use are probably different than the folks who are designers because I'm a researcher. Um, but one of, you know, I use user research tools, right? And my favorite being ethnography, which is um, building deep understanding with the people that you are building for. But um, what I hope to see happening in the future and what I'm seeing like pushes, pushes for is on the research space, we need to, I think we need to break the tools of user research a little bit because um, they're they're a little exploitative, particularly if we want to engage people who tend not to be included in the design process to um, to engage with folks in a way that is only sort of asking them about about their experiences, but not giving them a seat at the table in the design is um, is is not fundamentally shifting inequities, right? So I think the research tools that we're gonna be moving towards and that I'm that I'm really excited and I'm, I'm trying to figure out how I engage with these tools more are things like participatory design and co-design. Um, and also things like, <laughs> like how about just hiring, right? H hiring more diverse groups, right? But we, we've got a lot of DNI tools, right? And we've gotta get more diverse folks at the table. Okay. Molly, absolutely love that. And, you know, as a researcher myself, deep research like ethnography is so valuable and not many people have the opportunity to do it. So when we do have that value feeding in like a fuel into the system, you know, making sure that that's available and that we share that in ways that other people can can learn from that's really important. Johan, over to you. You've heard some really fabulous inputs from the others, and I know you have some very interesting perspectives also bringing in other senses. What are the tools that excite you that are available or approaches that you think we can bring to Immersive that may support people creating more inclusive solutions? Yes, and actually I love to bring the um the perspective of inclusive design management here as well, because I think that that connects also with the sensory experience as we're going into immersive technology. Um, I think one of the things that we've talked about already is trying not to narrow our perspectives down to just one solution and to hold off within our design process and really look at the ideation process as an excellent opportunity for us to innovate. So we need to broaden out with an emerging technology. We need to broaden out instead of having a narrow solution, having more customizable, more comfortable solutions using different senses, um, not just relying on the accessibility perspective. But yeah, we hold off on that and do a lot of research um, based on extreme experiences. Um, and then we can actually hone in on accessibility later on um, as we're actually de de designing for everyone. Hopefully the accessibility will be built in from the start. Um, so from a design management perspective and from a sensory experience design perspective, I'd like to say that um, 
I'm trying to avoid just designing for the technology. As James said, it's very, very complicated when we design just for technology or one tool. So um, one of the things I'd like us to look at when we're thinking about inclusive design and sensory experience design in the immersive space is to look at um, all of the senses that are going to be involved um, and what kind of tools we actually have available. We have a lot of audiovisual tools. Um, if we're looking at, for instance, creating an immersive experience with like uh, motorcycles. Uh, we think about the actual full experience, um, the auditory experience, smell experience. Um, we try and see what kind of technology we have available that can provide us some sort of connection with that experience. And then we make those experiences customizable. Um, that's actually my dream, is that in this immersive environment, whether it be AR or VR, that we would be able to make them customizable so that no one person is overwhelmed uh, by any experience. Someone can have a full sensory experience using all of the senses, and then other people can use one or the other. And that by rote, what we create is a fully inclusive and accessible experience at the end. Oh, thank you. So, yeah. And I think that inclusive leadership is really important when we're developing all of these tools to make sure that that's available. Thank you so much. And that's, I, I think that inclusive design management approach, that is true right across um, you know, all layers of this. And whether it's ideation and boarding out early, but also that adaptability rather than a one size fits no one, really thinking about how do we design solutions where, as you say, people aren't overwhelmed, but they are included. And that requires people being able to adapt to their preference and needs. Can I ask you to finish up by sharing two things? One thing that you really wish was there today, so a gap that's there that you wish was fulfilled, and one thing that you wish that people who are listening to this today could take away. And just keep it fairly short each, but Regine, if I can start with you. Uh, from a learning perspective, I think wherever you see that you have some interest, you might have interest in augmented reality, you might have interest in virtual reality, virtual reality. you may not know what any of it is. Um, so I would say just start learning. Um, and I think, you know, I'm, I'm big now on moving from awareness to action. And so become aware and then start acting, start doing, start getting involved. Thank you, Regine. I love them. Molly, over to you. Yeah. Um, one thing that I see is not being there is there are not enough people hired who are building these XR technologies who come from underrepresented or diverse perspectives, right? So that's not there. So let's work on that. And one thing that people can do is for those of you who are designing, um, consider deeper engagements with research. Of course, I'm gonna put a plug in for research, right? But let's, let's um, make sure we're putting a really concerted effort towards talking to the people who are going to be using this technology or who you might not even imagine who will be using the technology, right? Get their perspectives and let those guide where, where you want to build. Thank you, Molly. Johan, over to you. Okay, so my dream for the XR space is really for people from different cultures, from different backgrounds, from diverse perspectives, be part of a co-creation process that we all learn from each other, become introspective, and really that we create a co-creative community um, of people with diverse experiences. Um, and that, you know, within the XR space, what I want you to learn is that we are not going to try and start from just the solution. I don't want people to be afraid. I want them to think about um, this as an opportunity for us to create experiences for everyone um, and that we can learn from people with excluded experiences to create incredible experiences for all. Thank you, Johan. What a great message. James, to you. There's probably some still fundamental things that, like very fundamental things that have nothing to do with XR uh, as a technology to uh, be more accessible. It's just like getting good you know, it sounds like a corny answer, but getting good internet, getting computers, getting hardware into people's hands 
you know, like if somebody has a computer and let's say, uh, you know, a VR headset, you know, they have so and, and a good internet connection, they have like those three pieces, they can open the door for, for a lot of things. Thank you for that, James. And I think it's a really important point that actually it is still a niche technology because of the hardware problem and that, you know, while there's only a small number of people that have access to hardware and while we're talking about specifically hardware enabled experience as opposed to, you know, experience that could be um, got through a mobile phone or through a standard computer that has XR elements in it, it's still very, very exclusive as opposed to inclusive. So um, absolutely right. Just to summarise, firstly, can I say thank you to you all. That was a fabulous discussion. I really enjoyed it and so many good points across all of you. I'm going to just pull up a couple of them for, for um, folk here just start learning. We're all on this journey and just starting to learn is the most important thing. But then as Regine said, switching from learning to action. So don't learn for the sake of it, but learn for the purpose of it. Um, and lots of different ways you can learn, but that listening, co-creating, researching, asking your colleagues that have different experiences, hiring colleagues with different experiences so that we can create, as Johan said, you know, the opportunity to create absolutely excellent experiences for everyone. Thank you so much for your time today. For everyone listening, I hope you have a fabulous rest of your XR access and I look forward to seeing you in the next sessions and particularly in the Q&A now. Thank you, Christine, Johan, Jean, Molly, and James. That was a fantastic discussion. So as a reminder for our attendees, you can post questions to the panelists in the topic design channel on Slack. So our first attendee question is, and I'm gonna send this to Christine, is in what key ways does XR accessibility design differ from traditional accessibility design like web development or real world spaces? That is a fabulous question. Thank you to whoever posed that. Um, the, some of the key differences are the experience itself is absorbed in a different format. So the format that people are absorbing that through can create exclusion or inclusion by itself. And there are so many different formats, whether it's um, the headsets, whether it's just uh, using a 2D, but with a 3D overlay on it, such as AR on a smartphone, et cetera. So each of those formats, there's a, a hardware element to inclusion or exclusion that is a little bit different because it's new. Interestingly, I'll, I'll flip it a little bit and say there's a lot of similarity to, but it, it's where it brings it together because XR is this fabulously interesting space because it brings both physical design, physical product design, as I've just mentioned, physical environment design, things like wayfinding um, is just as important in XR as it is in the physical world if you're finding a way through a, a maze or a, a, an environment, and digital design and content design and, and content management. So, you know, a lot of the tools and approaches we've used in 2D technologies, captioning, um, audio described, uh, clear content, content, uh, visual design and so on, is all just as relevant here. So it's a, it's a merging essentially of these three areas of physical product, physical environment and digital design all coming together. The point at which you can test it though is experience. So it's just understanding at the end of it, it's a new experience and how is that experience received by people with different access needs, with different preferences and with different approaches. Um, and yeah, asking and understanding that is how we can solve for this. Um, thank you, Christine. So our next question is from Deb on Slack. Um, I'll send it to Christine and then the other panelists can comment if you uh, if you would like. Um, what workflow do you follow when designing for XR? I might pass that to someone else. Um, James, do you want to take this one of the first one? I, and also, if anyone wants to add to my answer on the last one, please feel free to. But James, do you want to start on this one? Um, workflow for the design process for XR. That is, um, 
probably a very fluid question. I can probably, it depends on the project, like, and depends on what your role is in, on the project. And it also depends on where the project is, like if you're coming into the middle or if you're starting from scratch. Um, uh, so like, I guess if you're, if you're, let's just say hypothetically, you're by yourself and as a UX designer, I could probably come from that. That's probably my best, uh, give you experience in that regard. Be a UX designer, starting from scratch. I highly recommend you start doing uh, research and broad terms of re technical research in terms of, um, but more probably more importantly is what problem you're trying to solve. What kind of value you're trying to provide people? And this is just general good uh, product design. It has nothing to do with XR. And XR is sort of like, I, my, my belief is like XR is a solution and that has nothing to do with the problem and just trying to figure out the problem. And then I think more relevant to the uh, XR access and um, is uh, you, you want to start uh, figuring out how you're going to start listening to people really quick and starting to uh, uh, you know, get participants of varying backgrounds. You, you, due to constraints, you probably have to be more focused on, okay, who am I going to uh, listen to in this problem space that I'm trying to address? And um, try to define that, make assumptions. You have to start making assumptions at some point. And then as time goes forward, maybe, you know, back that up or, you know, reevaluate things and iterate on those research assumptions. But start doing user research if you want to define, doing what's called problem setting, which has nothing to do with XR. It has, it has everything to do with figuring out what, you know, what value or problem, however you want to frame it. it you know, not everything is a problem. So, like, if you're making a game, uh, you, you're you creating entertainment and adds value to people. Uh, the, the solution space is a totally different pathway. And that's and, and if XR is the solution for you, well, then you're opening up a whole, you know, wide spectrum of, of technical possibilities, whether it's mobile and tablet augmented reality. If, if you think, and then, you know, knowing what solution to use, it also requires technical research. And, you know, it's a whole different, you know, um, thing to assess. And and as far as the design process, if, if let's just say you had all that stuff figured out, the problem is set, the strategy is formed and all that stuff. And, you know, you should probably be doing this on a parallel basis. I mean, just prototyping, testing, iterating, and when I say testing, you know, if you can bring those people from the beginning uh, who are you were listening to into the, the user testing process, then that will help your product a lot more or, you know, just getting participants. But, you know, start, uh, um, and, you know, that's sort of an abstract uh, view. Uh, this is just, you know, it, and when it comes to UX design, it's all. Uh, it's, there's very little. Hey, <laughs> there's very little. There's very little um, different. I mean, there's probably more, a lot more nuance and things that are specific to XR products. And even within XR, there's like wearable XR. There's mobile and tablet-based uh, AR type of products. So um, uh, we can get into the weeds and specifics on that. But in terms of an abstract, broad, higher, you know, that's probably the sort of the pathway I would, in general. Go with. Great. Thank you so much, James. Um, so I'm going to send the next question to Molly, actually. Um, so this is from Jesse on Slack. As an XR user, what do you recommend as the best way to directly communicate with developers and platforms on improving accessibility? Uh, thank you so much for the question. I think. Um, the best way for me to answer that is is to say that first of all, if you are having a hard time reaching out to to folks to get your feedback back to them, that's that's not your fault. We need to make sure that the organizations that are creating these um, these technologies have a way to really account for accessibility and really account for the feedback of. Um, people who have accessibility needs. I know at Adobe, that's something that we're working to build out right now. Um, and from a business side, it's hard. <laughs> from, from the consumer side, I think that anything that you can do for now until there's a really, a really good pathway for you to communicate with, for instance, somebody who's working on Oculus, which would 
ideally in my perspective be something like a um, a continued research engagement or a continued almost co-design. Um, but until that structure is there, you can communicate on thing about things on on platforms like Twitter. Um, you can add feature requests because those, from what I've seen on the business side, when when people realize that customers are asking about these accessibility things, that's how um, people who are making decisions about where to spend resources who might not really understand uh, sort of the necessity for accessibility. That's the best way to to get their attention, right? So it's that's I think as an individual, that's the best thing that you can do for now. I I think your question is an indication that as an industry, right, um, XR and tech in general still needs to continue to build out these pipelines so that we have a we have a much easier way of connecting with people. I know that um, some of the folks on this panel. Uh, have have built out that pathway already, right? So some organizations do better than others, but I think I think it's it's a big problem, and I think that um, until you've got a pathway, just just making sure that you're sort of publicly saying, hey, I'm, you know, the, these are the things I need, right? That will help build a business case for why there should be a deeper engagement on accessibility and ultimately a um, a, a connection between people who are um, using XR and people who have accessibility needs. And thank you so much for the question. Thank you, Molly. So uh, we've got a couple questions in the chat about what it's like to do user research during the pandemic. So what are the challenges that you faced with, um, actually I'm gonna send this to Regine and then you can pass it off to others if there's other um, input. Um, what are the challenges that you've encountered or maybe successes with using remote tools for user research? Um, any, and what sort of workarounds have you found to by bypass those challenges? Well, obviously um, we cannot meet anybody in person. So that is the biggest challenge, but Zoom, Zoom has been lovely. Um, Zoom for, usability um, testing has has worked um, well actually and having the ability to kind of you know record these things and see them back um, one of the things is there's been more availability of folks because people are at home um, so there's there is that and I don't know uh, it, it has been a challenge, especially in the XR space where um, with, you know, having headsets and, and not necessarily being able to, before we used to share headsets and now that's not a thing. Um, so my, my, my research hasn't involved much of that uh, yet, but it will. And so it's gonna be interesting to see how um, to move forward, but I'm, I'm sure Molly has some some more insight than me. I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I think that, yeah, I, I think I'm just, I was just sort of responding to Jesse on Slack and um, I'm thinking about how we actually make this structural change, right? It's, it's a question of, of individuals who are using, using the technology and then, um, it's a it's really also a question about being able to really articulate the business case so that um, we can have more support and deeper engagement. I could add a little bit to that as well. I think you know the wonderful thing about being inclusive researchers is we were quite well set up for the pandemic because it made it easier to reach to more people by having some people uh, engaging remotely even prior to the pandemic period. So using formats such as Zoom um, and, and mixed formats, which will probably move to again in the future, as some people wish to engage face-to-face -face and some people wish to stay you know, isolated um, for longer or just find travel difficult, um, is something that is really helpful to everyone. Um, so people can choose what format best suits them and they can save their energy for the participation, not for the getting there and getting back, um, whether that's 
virtual or physical. Um, a couple of things. You know, one really good point to Eugene about keeping people safe and particularly things like sharing devices between people. Um, and there are ways of cleaning products off really well. We've done another project on antimicrobial treatment of, of products. Um, so making sure that if there is any sharing of devices that it goes back to someone, it gets fully cleaned, deep cleaned, and then sent to anyone else. It is difficult in XR because not everyone has a device that you want to test on. And it means that you may go otherwise to people that already have um, experience of using devices more so. So just recognising if you're building bias in to some degree, either by more experience or less, that you're understanding where you're building that in. So it's not a problem, it's just uh, a recognition. The other thing with inclusive research is, um, as, as Tom, my research director, would always remind me um, that it's a little bit more time up front. It's just making sure you create the time up front to think through how this experience is going to play out for everyone involved in the research and creating the right sets of information for each of them in a way that suits them, that they can understand and they can therefore, as say, turn up with all their energy intact for the session itself. Thank you, Christine. I'll probably add. Um, I have something to add to that as well, Johanna say. So, oh, yeah. Go ahead, Johanna. Um, so I'm going to, oh, yeah. Okay. So one example is that a lot of companies actually invest more money on re user research now, mostly with AR because of the pandemic. Because in a lot of cases, people are afraid to go to a lot of stores and they feel that they can't go or they feel that they really can't touch things. So they're investing more in user research in regards to that in ways that people can use AR technology to actually tour a facility, to buy a bed or another product. And I believe that the pandemic has had positive impact in that way. It happened to lead to making accessibility better for other people as well. So people with and without disabilities. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Um, well, I, I so, guess uh, to build on some of the comments made um, already, like the user testing in person is is very difficult during the pandemic, and and obviously, like just as everyone said, like um, with wearable VR or AR, you know, being in person is is you get so much richer feedback on especially with people who've never touched vr or ar uh products before so uh the, so there is so like there it has been a learning curve i think there is an opportunity to create uh remote tools uh rather than boutique tools but uh, remote tools to help with remote user testing um where you know there's so much you can get so much feedback just from like the motion control movements and you can record that and then um uh, record whether it's the motion controllers or hand tracking or uh eye tracking or you know i mean obviously with the participants you know full part um permission of course and so like uh yeah i mean the pandemic you know doing remote testing with people who own, like um, Christina said, with people who only have the equipment, you know, it sort of narrow narrows your user base in uh, in a not in a great way. And so, um, uh, yeah, it's been a learning curve, at least from my perspective. So, I don't have really a, a great answer, but it is definitely something everyone's trying to figure out together. Thank you all very much for those great answers. Um, so our next kind of question comes from Miles on Slack. Um, I'm going to send this one to Johan. Um, do you feel we have enough people with disabilities who are taking leadership roles in XR Access-like initiatives? And if not, what can we do to increase represent representation of people with disabilities in these roles? A oh, really good question. But I would like to be careful with this because we make quick assumptions. Because people with disabilities 
um, that, they're, um, that are invisible uh, make up about 70% of the population. So it's a challenge for us. There are a lot of people who are willing to say that they have a disability and other people that do not want to label themselves as such. So it is a challenge. My belief is that in the US, there is a lot of leadership on this front. In Europe, this is a, we're a bit behind. Um, the challenge is that we are trying to advocate in Africa as well, but the cultural context of the country has an effect. So we need to improve actually the leadership and in inclusive design, not related to whether or not you have a disability, but really about empowering that leadership and empowering people with disabilities, whether they be visible or invisible. Um, it is also best um, to teach trainings to people who have disabilities, to allow them to become leaders, to mentor them. Um, my mentor taught me how to bring myself forward, how to empower others, how to advocate for myself and my community, and that has a lot of impact. So it's very important for people with disabilities to be in these leadership positions, but we do have to have patience until they get up to that point. Thank you very much. Um, our next question comes from Bill on Slack. What are some, uh, I'll send this one to uh, Christine. What are some of the new possibilities for inclusive design in XR that result from new kinds of sensors and input devices? And also going off of that, um, in general, what are some hardware limitations? So how to include input for different kinds of senses? Great question, thank you. Um, sensors are such an interesting thing because they allow us to pick up one of the great gaps that we have once we move away from in-person research and we're doing more remote research. So this is what James was alluding to before. As an example, you can see how people are moving. A bit like uh, in 2D, we can see eye tracking and we can see where on a screen people are, um, you know, are touching it with their eyes and how much time they're spending on it. So the kind of heat maps. We can do the same in XR by using sensors to start to pick up how are people engaging? So what are they doing? What are they acting on? That allows us to pick up two sides of research. What is behavioural, which is what are people doing? And the other is attitudinal by asking them, what are you thinking now? What are you looking for next? What are you trying to find here? What are you trying to solve? Or, or, or how does that make you feel? So the kind of attitudinal questions. Sensors will make this much easier to do. They do come obviously with consent. They do, you know, anything that we ask people to do, um, where that feedback goes back, making it clear to people that this is how we're collecting information and therefore your movements will be, be taken as well or your eyes uh, and so on. So just making it really clear and obvious to people how we're collecting information. The other thing that's really important that we haven't spoken about with research and is more important again in remote research is the end to end experience of setup, use, and put away. Because if you have a very accessible, say, content and piece of experience you're trying to test with someone with various access needs, but they can't set it up individually and independently, that might again limit who you can engage with to people where they've got someone else in the house that can help them with that. And it's one of those things that we've seen a lot with emerging technologies is the inclusive design often starts at the centre of the experience and takes a little while to work towards the edges of the experience from setting it up to uh, maintaining it, to keeping it charged, to you know being able to upload new information to it and so on. So that end-to-end -end experience is going to be more and more critical as well. I hope that answered that question. Anyone else wish to add anything to that? I'm sure that's about half an answer to a very good question. Um, you know, yeah, uh, just to build on what you said, Christine, the, you know, like, there, are, there's a lot of people with uh, motor disabilities who uh, can't even wear uh, VR or AR headsets as they are right now. So, I mean, obviously, everyone you know in the industries, you know, especially <laughs> the engineers and hardware manufacturers, have like a, a challenge ahead of them to try to make these wearables more 
uh, accessible in terms of like an industrial design sense, but also like there, on a, there's that end. There's also on the other end, uh, this technology has um, so much biometric uh, fidelity, as I would call it, where you can gather so much information and it's just going to increase as time goes forward, whether it's, uh, you know, just your head tracking, um, your hands, uh, even uh, what is also very important, I found, is like uh, the capacitive touch sensors on most of the VR and so some of the AR controllers, where uh, that matters. Like if you have uh, motor disabilities, you know, this, the, the sensitivity to this um, sensor, sensitivity to the sensors um, and how um, how much feedback they can they can gather from the user. Uh, it does matter. And and Regine has said in the past, like, uh, you know, just uh, options is also very important, not only options in terms of um, uh, sort of accessibility settings, but options in terms of input and the output, whether it's, you know, sound and haptics and stuff like that. So and, and, and like I said, also back again, like uh, the biometric sensors are just, you know, I, I see them just the standard and the the bar is just going to keep on uh, moving forward you know from eye, to eye tracking is almost a standard across devices and uh and i can speculate further but you know it's just uh it's gonna add it's gonna add so much more fidelity and what do we do with that okay. just just to you know, feed off what you're saying there, James. As with many things, I think extreme use cases will really drive this forward. And if you look at healthcare at the moment, and obviously healthcare has been exceptionally pushed over the last couple of years. So, um, you know, well, year and a half with the COVID um, crisis, that remote health has just had a huge boost of energy and XR is one way that remote health can be delivered and the requirements for sensors and to be able to know where people are in space if you're say delivering some physical therapy to someone where you're saving them from the, the pressure but also the time effort of going into um, a hospital which you know at the moment is overloaded anyway um, we can use it. XR technology for that. And I know there's been a huge amount of uh, use cases developing in that area. And that's where I go looking for some of that early uh, use of sensors and sensor enabled uh, capability because they need to make it right there. And then building that in, as you say, into optionality for who would need that just in other um, parts of technology. That's all. Can I add on to that as well? Um, yeah, I'm I'm thinking about what Christine said about sort of the end-to-end -end experience. And if we're thinking about um, starting from just the experience, right, we're not necessarily thinking about how people acquire the hardware that they need for VR. So that's a question that we need to think about as well, right? If we if we want to enable these experiences for more people, how are we also going to enable them to purchase the hardware, right? And how are we going to um, empower them to sort of get to the accessibility that so many people have been thinking about. Absolutely. Thank you so much, all of you, yeah. for uh, such a great discussion. Um, we have one minute left, so I'm hoping we can do one more rapid fire question. So I'm going to give this one to Johan first, but I'd love to hear quick answers from all of you on this one. So what, in your opinion, is the one greatest unsolved challenge in accessibility in user experience and interaction? Well, a lot of people actually focus on quick solutions within UX. And what we need to do is practice divergent thinking first and really focus on human-centered design brainstorm ideas, and then focus on our solution. So not go to accessibility first, but learning from that first and do divergent thinking and then focus on our solution later. Um, Christine, I'll, do you want to take I'll the next? In. Oh, okay. sorry, Molly, Molly oh. go ahead, yeah. Okay, Molly. I'll pop in and, and this is just, um, this is just, I, I keep reading the chat, right? And we're seeing a lot of people who are wanting to give feedback and not sure how to do that. And I think that 
um, we need to enable like a, a better pipeline and a and a a stronger infrastructure and platform for something like co-design so the people who are actually using this technology have a way to uh, get their feedback in a in a more you know structurally supported way molly i'll pick up on that and add, add my short one here which is if you don't know where to provide your feedback come and join xr access we would love to have you so come and join the idxr community um, because this is a place that we're hoping to gather that feedback and you know use it so even if it's just as a hub that can then go out so join the community and get involved and secondly for the people who are creating in any format um, whether it's designers developers hardware manufacturers any level of creation across the, the process that comment that um, Johan said start at the edges start if you can only you know, I often say if you can only get six people to feed back on something go right to the edges of experience mm -hmm. and start there because for all that someone will be on the edge of experience in one of their characteristics their other characteristics will take them through the center so you're not missing out on anything but you're gaining a lot more and the more difference you have between the different people that you've got engaged, the greater the diversity of perspectives you've got to design with, for, and to create a solution that will solve and, and support. And um, I would just add that um, to Johan's point, human-centered design, um, what unites us as humans <laughs> and what connects us all. And, cross-culturally, because I think a lot of things tend to be from a Western perspective. Um, this morning I was talking to somebody from the University of Kuwait and there's a completely different perspective. So I think looking at things from a human-centered design perspective and um, cross-culturally, right, and interculturally um, is, is something that we can do a lot more of and a lot better. I'll probably, um... I'll probably say, you know, I'm going to, uh, Regina has said lately in the past uh, that uh, action right now is uh, very much a requirement. I, I think that in the XR space, you know, there's enough, uh, things have matured enough where um, uh, we can, you know, build things and iterate and, and learn from it and, you know, continue to develop. Uh, tools in the XR space. So I think um, more uh, tools for developers um, to implement these various options. Because right now, I mean, it, it depends on the what tools they use and um, what you know what platforms they use. But for XR, you know, the easier you can make um, a developer. Uh, and this is this goes into the building problem. This goes into like you know focusing on. You know, just like if you can, fo uh, it, it, building off what everybody already said, like it's just focusing on one space, see if you can build something that developers can use and they can just plug it into, you know, Unreal Engine, Unity, whatever platform. And that's that's hard. It's not easy. It's it's definitely, an, uh, we're in the, and when we talk about action, it's partly uh, an engineering problem. And that's where we're at right now, I think, with XR. It has developed enough where um, it's, there's design problems and there's also engineering problems. And uh, uh, building these things, you know, hopefully will come sooner than later. Well, thank you all for these fantastic answers again. Um, that's all the time we have for questions. There are a few other questions that did not get answered in the Slack channel, so I'm hoping that some of our panelists can stay around for a few more minutes and answer questions there. And now we're going to move into a 15-minute break. Great. We will now take a 15-minute break. 